as we are transitioning to a new administration, we're going to see some new faces around the table, including the one standing at the podium here chairing for the first time today. So uh, why don't we start with some introductions of ourselves so the new folks recognize everyone as well as your role. So Mark, you want to start? Mark Fairchild, Executive Director of the Commission on Improving the Status of Children. Justin Forkner, Chief Administrative Officer for the Indian Supreme Court. Still representative of Vanessa Summers House, District 99. Good morning, Catherine Box. I'm a health policy advisor in Governor Holcomb's office, so I'm here for John Hammond. Good morning, I'm Amy Kent, Chief Strategy Officer with the Department of Health, here on behalf of Dr. Lindsay Weaver. Good morning, I'm Chris Naylor, Executive Director with the Prosecuting Attorneys Council. Hi, I'm Rich McCaffrey. I am the Assistant Director of Youth Services with DOC. I'm Dan Orsiniak. I'm the Secretary of the Family Social Service Administration. My name is Corey George. I'm the Chief Probation Officer in Wayne County. Good morning. I'm Stacey Donato, State Senate District 18. Dale Devon, State Representative, District 5, St. Joe County, home of the Fighting Irish. <laughs> and online, we have Bernice Corley, Executive Director of the Indiana Public Defender Council. <laughs> And Dana Kenworthy from the Court of Appeals of Indiana. And I want to say thank you. I don't know if he's watching out there uh, online, but John Hammond has been with this organization probably longer than most of us in this room and has cycled through the chair position more than anyone else. So I want to say thank you to John Hammond for his long-term service on that committee and, and welcome Catherine to his position. All right, minutes have been circulated. Do we have any edits to the minutes? Motion to approve. Do we have a second? second? Any discussion? All in favor of approving the August minutes, say aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. All right, we'll jump right into our agenda today. And first up, we have a presentation regarding the Child Health and Safety Task Force and Dr. Jack Terman here, I believe, with us. Hi, well, good morning, and thank you so much for having me back to talk to you all. Um, I met you all and spoke with you all probably a couple of years ago when I first received the grant from HRSA to um, bring about health, health, uh, housing equity for infant health. And I'm really excited to be here with you all today. You will be the first to hear the updates, to hear how things are going, to hear um, how we're progressing. And um, so I'm really excited for all of you because um, I've been to these meetings and I know that oftentimes state commissions hear a lot about problems and I'm going to address problems, yes, but I'm here to give you positive news and positive results and share with you how things are progressing in our work. So it's a pleasure to be here. So um, I'm going to talk about our Housing Equity for Infant Health grant. This is a grant that um, is funded um, by the Department of Health, Resources, Health uh, Resources and Services Administration um, in uh, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. So we're very grateful for um, their support of this. I always start all my talks with gratitude. Blaine was right. It's really hard to see that. <laughs> my glasses on. <laughs> um, so, um, so I always want to start with gratitude. First, I'm going to start with funders. This kind of stuff costs money. Um, so the department, so HRSA from U.S. Um, HHS two years ago, awarded my team one of nine Catalyst grants in the United States. The Catalyst grants were developed by the Department of HHS to bring about innovative ways to improve birth outcomes in communities that suffer on disproportionate rates of infant mortality. That funding did not include rental assistant funds, and you're going to hear all about that today. So I want to acknowledge the Indiana Department of Health for their support of providing rental assistance funds, to Care Source Foundation for their support of providing funds for rental assistance, and for Burge and Held Properties um, for their um, support in providing funds for rental assistance. I'm going to talk about a lot of very hard work today, my friends. 24-7 work in the trenches with um, some of the most complex um, pregnancies in Indiana. This is not possible without a lot of hard work. So in front of you, I want to acknowledge 
the team that does all of this very hard work 24 seven. First, Dr. Paige Clemmy, who is um, on my staff and directs the Healthy Beginnings at Home intervention that I'm talking about. Um, next, Adam Mueller, an attorney and the director of the Indiana Justice Project. He directs the health justice intervention I'm going to talk about. Adam Brainerd from CareSource. CareSource um, is the originator of the Healthy Beginnings at Home intervention. And so we shout out to them because they called me up to see if I would lead this movement here in Indiana. And Bria Birdsong, a vice president at Ordar Housing Corporation, who plays a key role in the Healthy Beginnings at Home intervention that I'm going to talk about. I have an incredible staff that you see here and amazing community partners um, that are all, we all work together every day to do this. This is an important slide for you all because this is the Housing Equity for Infant Health Steering Committee. This is the committee that guides me, advises me, steers me, consults with me, and prepares me for my meetings for the Children's Commission Task Force. So these, all of these different partners provide input to me and counsel to me on this work and that I then report out um, um, quarterly to the, or, uh, to the Children's Commission Task Force. So first, uh, just a brief review of the problem, which I imagine you as members of the Children's Commission have heard many times. Indiana historically has always been in the bottom 10 for infant mortality in the United States of America. And unfortunately, we are on an upward trend again um, with the most recent data from 2022 saying that we have an infant mortality rate of 7.2 per 1,000 live births. What does this mean in real numbers to you all? Um, for instance, in 2022, 577 babies died. And over the past five years, we've lost 2,700 infants. These are deaths between birth and the baby's first birthday. Um, we have very high disparities, um, racial disparities in our infant mortality rates as the United States does. Um, I'm showing you the Marion County infant mortality data. Um, this is data that I collaborate with IDOH and then we do some calculations um, to understand excess, black excess deaths. So there is a formulary that we use to understand how many black babies are dying unnecessarily. And as you see here at the very bottom line of this very small table, um, you see that in 2022, we had 35 excess black infant deaths. Um, in the United States of America, in any mortality measure, any number, over 15, when you calculate excess deaths, um, which, bless you, between populations, if the number is greater than 15, it is a red flag that there's something very serious socially going on that leads to these excess deaths. And so you see here that for years, we've had a very high number of black excess deaths um, in Marion County. It is these data that even allowed me to be competitive for a Catalyst grant because um, the federal government is prioritizing innovative interventions in cities or jurisdictions that have a high number of excess infant deaths of any population, whether it be, it, like in our case, the African-American community or the Hispanic community or a Native American community. So, um, so this just shows that we continue to experience the black families in our communities experience infant mortality two to three times um, more than a white family does. So what does this teach us? I mean, other than it's a terrible emotional toll on a family, but why do governments spend so much time looking at infant mortality rates. Who is a major tracker of infant mortality? The CIA. We get very valuable data from the CIA about infant mortality because the CIA tracks infant mortality because research has shown that infant mortality is a critical indicator of a population's health and the stability of its society. 
So when one has high infant mortality rates, it teaches us that there's something going on in that population and in its society. So that is why there is so much emphasis on this number around the world. States, counties, cities, nations around the world track this because it gives you a window into the way that the people are being treated and how it cares for the foundation of any society, mothers and babies. And so that's why we prioritize this. When you look at this, you start to think about what is the major contributor to these numbers? It is not medicine. It is not genes. It is the social characteristics and the physical environment that surrounds a mother and her baby. So, and this comes from the CDC, this is validated by the United Nations, this is validated by the WHO, this is well known now that this social determinant is the critical factor that underlies these numbers. So, if you want to improve it, you have to spend, and you have to spend money and resources and time into addressing these characteristics. And so I'm gonna talk about, we are doing it. We are doing it in Indianapolis. We are addressing the social characteristics and the physical environment of our most vulnerable pregnant women and their children. In the Grassroots Maternal and Child Health Initiative, which I founded and direct, it's my greatest honor and career privilege, we ground everything in the stories of people. I'm a scientist. I love data, I love numbers, I love calculating, everyone knows that, right? But after 30 years of doing this, there are stories that lie between the numbers. And if you really wanna to get to the heart of the matter, you have to hashtag ask the women. That's the hashtag for our initiative. So this is Letitia's story. She was one of the original grassroots maternal and child health leaders who um, positively pressured me and pushed me to move forward with doing something about housing for pregnant women and their children. When we met Letitia, this was her story. She was pregnant. FYI, she was working full time. Let me stress that again. She was working full time and living in a car or living on the streets or living on a park bench because like so 52% of African-American people in the city of Indianapolis, you work full time, but you don't meet what we call the Alice threshold. You don't make enough money to meet your daily needs of rent, health, transportation, food. And so Letitia um, like wrote this story. It was published as an op-ed in the Northwest Indiana Times. And the, here's the line, it was scary to be there, pregnant and homeless. She lost her baby. And she didn't lose her baby for anything of her fault, my friends. She lost her baby due to a very rare medical condition. But she was working full time, trying to find a place to live and couldn't go to all the visits. So this is a story ever-growing story of our city, our state, and our nation. In the city of Indianapolis, on average, more than 250 pregnant women and their infants are homeless. That, and this count is homeless, like on the streets. But I can tell you that that's only part of the story because the people who do those counts, one of our awesome partners, the Coalition for Homelessness Intervention and Prevention, they can't possibly count every pregnant woman and every child who is experiencing housing insecurity because some are invisible. They're couch surf. They sleep in their cars. They sleep in cheap motels. They have terrible eviction records that can't get them 
a place to live. They're living in overcrowded conditions. They live in unspeakable, uninhabitable conditions. Five minutes from here, my friends. Worse conditions than I have seen as a global mental maternal and child health practitioner in all of my work around the world. And so they aren't counted. So, and I can tell you when I was a consultant for the Marion County Fetal Infant Mortality Review Committee, 50% of the infant deaths had housing insecurity as a contributing factor. So this is all so known. Housing insecurity has terrible effects on pregnant women and children. This is in your packet. I'm not going to read all of these things, but you see it affects their health. It affects the decisions they make. It affects the way they live. And then the baby comes. It increases low birth weight. It increases infant mortality. It increases preterm birth. It increases NICU stays, which costs a lot more money. And I leave every audience with this. If you take nothing from my talk, if you could just go out and remember this, being housing insecure increases your risk of having a preterm baby the same as smoking does. How many of you, how many of you have heard of smoking cessation programs during pregnancy? Lots of funding for smoking cessation pregnancy programs during pregnancy. How many of you heard have heard of housing security programs during pregnancy? Not many, because quite honestly, formally, there's only two. One in Ohio, the care source started, and right here, the housing equity for infant health work that we're doing. So please know that this is very important intervention that I'm gonna talk about now. Enough with the problems, it's time to start talking about solutions. So our grant works to provide housing security and support in the first thousand days of a child's life. I don't know whether you're familiar with this term and this conceptualization, but there's a very big movement across pediatrics and maternal and child health around the world that we must do everything we can to secure the first thousand days of a child's life. That's their whole pregnancy and the first two years postpartum. My career started as a developmental neuroscientist. That is my PhD. I started studying as a basic scientist how environmental, social, medical, and genetic perturbations impact fetal and infant health behavior and development. And, and me and other neuroscientists around 2010 got out of the lab. And as the women say, I went from the lab to the hood, all right? Because it wasn't right that we were keeping all of this information in a lab and not getting out to the people that need to hear it. And those people include you, the decision makers, the policy makers, and to the moms so that they know about this. So we're very focused on this. So our grant has two components. Are you ready? So now we're gonna like dive a little bit deeper. There's two interventions. Dr. Clemmy has healthy beginnings at home. Healthy beginnings at home consist of three components. Housing navigation services done by Bria and her team at our door. Comprehensive case management that Dr. Clemmy and all of our team of social work case managers leads and 24 months of rental assistance. The people in our program are pregnant women over 18 years of age in the first or second trimester. They are all um, verified as housing insecure and they're all care source Medicaid members. And the reason we honor that is because care source started this intervention. The second intervention I'm gonna talk about is the health justice intervention headed by Adam Mueller. The health justice intervention is very focused on building the capacity of the judicial and the legal systems to address the persistent problem of excessive evictions of pregnant women and children in Indiana. And we do three things in there in that intervention. We perform community-based education, strategic litigation, and legal analyses. 
So we're gonna start at Healthy Beginnings at Home, a very brief history. I want to shout out again to CareSource, that's very important. They developed this intervention in Columbus, Ohio um, in 2018. They had their first round of results in 2021, which I'm gonna show you in a second, a few of them. Um, um, in 2021, um, they reached out to me to see whether I would take the mantle of leading this initiative in Indiana. And um, that then prompted me to coalesce a team, work on writing the HRSA grant, getting the HRSA grant. We got the funding in September 1st of 2022, and seven, around seven, eight months later, in May of 2023, we launched our interventions. So the data I'm gonna show you is only 17 months of work so far. Um, so um, now, why is this so exciting? Because in the original Healthy Beginnings at Home intervention in Ohio, here's the great results. There was no infant mortality. It reduced preterm birth and reduced low birth weight babies. It reduced NICU stays. It reduced, um, it reduced um, emergency visits post-delivery. In other words, after the baby had come. And what caught the attention of Governor DeWine and um, his legislators is this. It's dramatically saved Medicaid spending in Ohio. So, um, so Governor DeWine very aggressively has moved forward with Healthy Beginnings at Home in Ohio. Remember the initial results were released in 2021. In 2022, he immediately allocated 2.25 million to continue Healthy Beginnings at Home and to expand it beyond Columbus, Ohio to surrounding county. He followed it up in 2023 as a part of his very large maternal and child health package. And here you see a quote from his website of pursuing a federal waiver to provide short-term housing and wraparound care, i.e. that's healthy beginnings at home, and um, charged to charged the people to grow healthy beginnings at home across the state. I just have to tell you, FYI, that's my dream in Indiana. All right. So, um, so, um, so here we go. Let's let me introduce to you healthy beginnings at home, Indianapolis style. All right. So, FYI, you may ask, like, why am I only doing this in Indianapolis? That's her instruction of her. Family. They don't have any control on that. HRSA requires that our work be done in only one jurisdiction, all right? So, um, and it has to be, um, uh, it, it, it has to be characterized by an excess infant death rate of a particular population. Does that make sense? So that's why we're focused at this point only in Indianapolis. So here I'm gonna to present to you our data from 2023 May of 2023 to the present. So now this is all fun, right? Like, what do we do? We provide a positive social network around every mother baby pair, all right? So we know from a whole lots of different fields of science that positive social networks work magic for people, all right? So in the middle of this little picture, you have the healthy beginnings at home mom and her family. Everyone has a case manager. Right? Everyone has a R door housing navigator. Everyone has an R door housing stabilization manager. Everyone has access to legal counsel and a legal advisor. We have a wonderful partnership with Rental Karma. Every woman gets access to financial advice, financial counseling. And Dr. Clemmy worked to deal with Rental Karma, where now the women's rent payments which we provide for counts towards their credit scores. So we're elevating their credit scores to help their futures have a better chance of getting a place on their own. Um, and they all have a CareSource life coach. So these are people at CareSource that can also help provide support. So you're looking at this, you're like, wow, Jack, the women have a lot of support. Absolutely, they have, they have all of these positive individuals walking their pregnancy journey with them and their postpartum journey with them, all right, to help support them through that. 
I want to start right out with outcomes at the systems level. And let me tell you why I'm doing that. Because another stipulation of this particular HRSA funding was, we must focus on creating systems change. HRSA is no longer interested in just showing individual outcomes. You have to demonstrate that you are working in your jurisdiction, your state, whatever, to bring about systems change. So I wanna share with you all the incredibly hard work that has gone on already to do this. So number one, we developed an intake system, a formalized intake system. So care source refers to us, 211 refers to us. Um, and, oh my gosh, and, and, and Dr. Clemmy created a self-referral link on our website so that people can self-refer. We also have collaborations with the mayor's tenant advocacy groups in the eviction courts, um, that they can refer people to us as well. Our big exciting, I'm so proud of my team around this, is we are rapidly housing pregnant women. When we started this work, on average in our city, it would take an average of 120 days to house a, a homeless person, a person experiencing housing insecurity. And with only a 70% success rate. Well, my friends, 120 days is a long time in a pregnancy. Mm -hmm. right? I want to reduce the toxic stress on the mother and the fetus. So I got to get her housed. So all these people like, on my team probably are like, enough, Jack. Do you know what I mean? Like, we got to get them housed. I'm very proud to say that this team of Dr. Clemmy, Bria and Adam created a system. We house 100% of the women in an average of 37 days. That's from intake to walking in their apartment. That is huge. And you're going to begin to see how this is playing out when I start showing you outcomes, all right? Another thing too is a huge shout out to Dr. Clemmy and Priya and the Indianapolis Housing Authority. When I was writing this, I was very worried about sustainability because the last thing you wanna to do to a family, say, I'm gonna house you for a little bit and then, oh, well, you're done, you gotta go. You know what I mean? Like, well, what, what good am I doing a family and a person by doing that? So the housing authority at that point had no mechanism to prioritize pregnant people. And so um, through working with them and Bria and the Ardor people, Dr. Clemmy and our social work staff, I'm really proud to say that in Indianapolis now, um, we have this, we have a system, we have a way and of our first 25 participants, 11 of them, 11 of them now have Section 8 housing. They have sustainable housing. And, um, and they've developed a system where all the women in our program will go through that. So by the time they're done, they'll have Section 8 housing and they'll have sustainable housing. That's a huge win for us. And it took a heck of a lot of work from this team doing this. Very important for you all as Children Commission members, we've established a very sophisticated data tracking system. We're tracking health outcomes, social outcomes, economic outcomes, involvement in DCS, a, a whole wide range of things. We conduct qualitative interviews with all the participants because hashtag ask the women. I wanna know like, how is it working? How can we make it better? What's their perspective on this? So we have all of that. And if you invite me back, as we keep going down this journey, I'll be able to reveal more and more of these data. Um, I'm so sorry. So real brief, who is self-referring? Who, who, remember I showed you a slide where it said like 250 women every year are pregnant and homeless, but who are they? Like we wanna know more about that. So through Dr. Clemmy's intake system, we are beginning to get this. Um, I just think I, I, oh, here we go. 
So I can tell you from September of 2023 to October 1st of this year, um, 220 people completed the intake link and 199 were pregnant. Very importantly, most all were insured. They have insurance, they all have Medicaid, most have Medicaid. Um, very importantly, you see here on the, on the table, on the pie chart, that about around 50% of them are outright homeless, all right? So that's like living on the streets. And then around another 50% are housing unstable. They're in their primarily first or second trimester of pregnancy. And 50%, I mean, sorry, 39.8% have an eviction history. So this begins to give us a sense of who the people are before they even come in. Like who, who is characterizing this, this population in our city? So the next thing I'm gonna do, I'm gonna break this down a little bit for you, my friends. The first thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to introduce you to the data of our first 25 participants, okay? We have 27 now, we have 28 participants now, but these data come from the first 25. Now, very importantly, these are data that they provide when they intake, right? So this is when they come into our program, Dr. Clamey and her staff meet with them, go through an extensive process and, and so that we can learn about them and how to best serve them, all right? So from these data, you see these are primarily black and brown women, um, um, primarily black women. Um, and um, which goes with all of the data and, I, and our hypotheses. In Indiana, you're going to see, I'm gonna show you the data in Indianapolis, who's most likely to be evicted? A young black woman with a family. So, um, so this is kind of, we're seeing this. Um, they are single. They, um, more than 50% have a high school education or less. And I'm gonna like put in cool shout outs because of the hard work of the team. Two other participants have now gone back to school since being in our program. So they're advancing their education and we're so proud of them and encouraging them on this. Um, when you go to the next um, slide, you see that 72% um, had a prior eviction and 61% had sealable evictions. We'll come back to that, but they didn't know that when they entered our program. They have primarily themselves and one or two other children. Um, very importantly, 44% are working, all right? And their average wage is $16.56. But again, this is not enough in Indianapolis to meet the basic needs of housing, health, transportation, and food. Very importantly, because we hear this all the time, oh, they don't wanna work, they're not working, things like that. Why aren't those who aren't working, why aren't they working? Because of the medical conditions of their pregnancy. So what do you do if you're, oh, ladies, what do you do if your OBGYN tells you you can't work because you're a high-risk pregnancy? You go to work. Yeah, you know, I mean like, so, so you have these kind of issues, right? That, in, that are, that these women are dealing with as well as transportation issues. Also, we learned that they have hiring a hard time paying their utilities, their car payments, affording, affording hygiene supplies, affording food. Um, here you see their average credit score, only 15 uh, participants allowed us to access that or get that from them. Very importantly is the average debt. Look at the average debt they're carrying, $22,000. And most of that, my friends, is medical debt, all right? So um, from medical conditions. So then like our first, oops. See. Oh yeah, here we go, I'm so sorry. Um, then what are, what are their health characteristics? Well, you see here from this that um, nearly 60% are categorical high-risk pregnancy. So this worries us, this is troubling, right? Because these are the, individuals that would be very vulnerable for a poor birth outcome, right? Um, and in terms of their mental status and intake, you see here that 50%, um, nearly 50% have moderate to severe depression or moderate to severe anxiety. And I really want to stress something to you that remember, this is at intake. Most of us would have 
moderate to severe or depression and anxiety at intake if you're housing insecure and you know you're pregnant, right? So this is not stigmatizing or labeling them. This is the reality of living in this situation. And their ACE scores average is 4.4. So this is adverse childhood experiences. That means that prior to the age of 18, they experienced four to five adversities in their life. And an ACE score over three generally predicts that you're gonna have poor mental health and physical health outcomes. So, um, so you kind of get a sense of who these awesome women are and they are awesome. Well, here's your first hearing from them. Like, so we asked them, what led to their housing security? Hashtag, ask the women. Don't judge, ask them, like, what happened? Three major themes immediately emerge. Finances, and habitable living conditions, and toxic environments, i.e. toxic relationships. It goes something like this. Do you know how much rent increased last October 1st in Indianapolis? 36%. We had the highest rent increase of any major city in the United States. Did the women get wage increases of 36%? No. So your rent goes up. You can't afford to live in the place you're living anymore. We have few affordable housing units available here. You might be medically fragile and not able to work because of your pregnancy and you're suddenly housing these people. I gotta live someplace. <clears throat> so I take a slumlord's place that's filled with rats, feces, mold, and water pouring through the walls. Team, am I exaggerating on the reality of this? Are you not? No. Not at all. And so then, to get that car ride to the doctor you're supposed to go to, I have to engage with a man who beats me. That's the only ride I have. That's the story, my friends. I'm not exaggerating. I'm not embellishing. I'm just telling you, this is the story that is happening all the time here. Well, there's our first healthy beginnings at home mom. And that's our health first healthy beginnings at home baby. And we got news coverage and there's a link to the story. And so here is, we've had 24 deliveries of our first 25 participants. 19 delivered full term infants, 79% full term infants. We had two preterm twins, one pair of late preterm twins. Um, those don't stress us too much. I mean, no, I don't want any preterm birth, but twins tend to come maybe a little bit early. Do you know what I mean? Like, so that happens. And we have a lot of twins, by the way. And um, and one late preterm infant, in full disclosure, we had one fetal loss. Um, a young woman enrolled in our program. We had just started working with her. She hadn't been housed yet. She was going through intake and, and lost her fetuses. She had twins as well. So, um, so I'm very happy to see this and to see these moms with these babies. So, um, so we're off to a good start, but that's not really good. I mean, but as a scientist, I have to do comparisons, right? Because I have to know, like, is it really making a difference compared to a comparison group? And, and so through our collaboration with CareSource, we, once we had 25 participants, they released to us comparison data. So these are women, similar to the women in our program, who did not opt for healthy beginnings at home. Does that make sense? So these are women who are not going through our intervention. Now, I just want to stress this to you because it, I don't want to be so confusing because the numbers shift here. So what I'm going to present to you is the initial data. You're the first to see this. I, this is the release of this right now, literally. Um, and But we're very stringent on this. So I'm only showing you outcomes from our first 11 participants that were housed in 2023 because we have the data from CareSource that can validate 
findings. Does that make sense? I'm not going to present to you stuff unless I know it's valid and has been validated with multiple sources. And so that we know we know what we're talking about here with a lot of confidence, right? So, um, so I'm going to give you data from 11 women in our program, our first 11, versus 18 who are not in our program. So far, so good. Does that make sense, everyone? Awesome deeds. Okay, well, here we go. We have twins. Like in the first 11, we had two sets of twins. The comparison group had no twins, all right? These cute little twins, they skew things, but anyway, still love them. But um, so <laughs> um, let's talk about gestational age. So you see here that our moms the, are keeping the babies in a few days more. But let me tell you something that I'm not putting on here. If I subtract the twin deliveries, our moms are keeping babies in an average of eight days more. Nothing makes a developmental neuroscientist happier than that because there's no better place for the fetal brain than in its mommy's womb. And so that we're keeping those babies in eight days more, awesome. Thank God. We have no infant mortality in either groups. I don't want infant mortality for any group, you know? Um, Preterm births, you see here a little, we're, we have three, they have four, but if you subtract the twins, <laughs> um, we have one, there's four. This one's very interesting. We're really seeing this trend um, of a reduction in low birth weight babies. Um, which makes us very happy um, to, to see that happening. Let's go on like, and see what else we're learning from this. Our moms tend to be more medically fragile. In the next group, you see here that our moms have a higher rate of medical fragility. Um, they also have more complex mental and behavioral health problems. Um, as you see there on the graph below with higher mental health disorders, substance use disorders, and tobacco use. Now, I'm very sensitive to this because I never want to stigmatize someone who has a substance use disorder. I challenge everyone in my whole career, don't stop there. Ask why, what led to that, all right? And let's work to get help. So I have good news. First of all, of the 11 babies, our first 11, only one had a positive drug screen at birth. Um, and um, two of the moms in our program have gone through recovery since being in our program. So, um, so our stability is allowing them to do these things that they wanna do. Now, this is gonna make every practitioner in the house so happy, because if you know anything about Indiana data and infant mortality and birth outcomes, it's all about not going to prenatal visits, right? It's all about not getting into prenatal visits. Check it out. Healthy beginnings at home moms, average nine prenatal visits. Um, versus the comparison group, which is around 6.5. We are exceeding the WHO standard of prenatal visits in this cohort. Um, they do have a higher number of ED visits during the pregnancy. That's likely due to the medical fragility that they have. And this, the third graph, the graph below, um, this is really cool. 91% had a first trimester vis visit um, to their OBGYN versus around 60% of the comparison group and 91% went to their well woman check postpartum. Um, um, so this is really awesome news. And that is all the hard work of the case managers that help them understand the importance of this. So, so um, those are like what we're getting. So how are we trending? What is the scoop? Our group tends to be more medically fragile but we're seeing longer gestational periods, fewer preterm births, freer low, fewer low birth weight babies, more prenatal visits, and more postpartum visits. So um, we're beginning to see these trends that this intervention of providing this housing stability and support actually begins to have um, on the women. So we're moving on to intervention two, the health, health justice intervention directed by Adam Mueller of the Indiana Justice Project. In brief, let me just tell you why I did this. Because Ohio did not do this. We're the only catalyst group 
that has included a health justice project. And you know I did it? Because the grassroots maternal and child health leaders taught me, Jack, you can't just give them a home. You got to address the issues in the legal system that drive them to housing insecurity. I knew nothing about the legal system when I started this. So um, thank goodness for Adam and his leadership. Here is the health justice intervention, providing legal education, strategic litigation, and legal services and legal analyses. This is the data. Um, this is our current eviction crisis that we have in Indiana. Um, this comes from, uh, this is data from September 1st from evictionlab.com at Princeton University. And as you probably know, Indianapolis and South Bend are two of the worst cities in the United States for eviction. Um, and um, here you see our eviction numbers um, over uh, uh, these different time periods. And hey friends, when are you most likely to be evicted a homeless in the United States of America? What age of your life are you most likely to be evicted and homeless? 20. As a baby, oh. as a child. In and America, the, the most likely time to be evicted and homeless is as a child. Because landlords have a real issue renting to families. So, um, so that's why this is a maternal and child health pediatrics issue. Who gets evicted in Indianapolis? This is provided by awesome Rabbi Aaron Spiegel at the Greater Indiana Multi-Faith Alliance, Fort Washington. Like I mentioned before, this is a phenomenon across the country. Who's most likely to be evicted? A young black female, mostly with at least one child. Um, so again, what are Adam systems change outcomes? Well, here we go. Like, so I'm not as fluent as this as all of the attorneys and judges in the room, but I'll do my very best. All right. So he's focused on these things, individual small claims court processes. So you see there that in two particular instances, one whole courtroom here, a judge has learned that if she does not provide the eviction, it allows the person to get rental assistance. And then they can come back and she can hear the case again. So she has delayed evicting and allows people now to go seek rental assistance help. And I'm really proud of one of our case managers who was an intern at the time, who went with, an, with one of our participants because you're gonna see her apartment here in a minute, before she came into our program, she was living in a completely uninhabitable place. She had to move out for the safety of herself and her baby. She, she filed a complaint against the landlord with the health department. The health department came and visited. Then she was evicted. And the landlord wanted her to pay $8,000 in damages. Uh, our awesome case manager like, no, 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 no. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> like, and that judge um, sent it to mediation, told the landlord didn't want to see him in court anymore, and down to $500. So anyway, like those are kind of little changes we're seeing. Um, they're working a lot with the Indiana State Supreme Court on rules changes there, um, currently under review, and a lot of great tenant protections, work, which I'm going to talk about here in a minute. The legal education component, you're all welcome to spread this around to everyone you know. We're happy to serve you. Um, we now have a community-based legal uh, Know Your Housing Rights campaign. We've served over 120 people um, since May of 2023. There's the link. You can send this to all of your friends, family, constituents, whoever, and the team will come out and provide a Know Your Rights training for them. Adams organized now two annual housing justice conferences to raise the awareness, the legal and the judicial system of the intersection of maternal and child health and housing. Last summer, summer of 2023, Adams team did strategic litigation in courts here and you see represented 11 adults. And there you see some of the outcomes that his team was able to get. But that has really shifted now to eviction ceiling. So, I'm so proud of the team and all the hard work and all the amazing legal partners, Indiana Legal Services, Neighborhood Christian Legal Clinic, 
pro bono Indiana um, um, that, that there are now these, we've had three eviction ceiling clinics. Check it out. Like, she's so proud of this. Like, um, 245 eviction ceiling motions filed um, and um, to help families. And thanks to Adam and his team's work, all of the sealable evictions of women in healthy beginnings at home are now sealed. They have, the evictions are sealed, their credit scores are going up. We're preparing them for a future that they won't have to deal with this in the same way. And now we're actually working on sealing the, un, the other evictions too, but that's more news to come. Um, we also, Adam and working with the clinic at the Bikini School of Law, um, wrote an amicus brief and the appellate court overturned the eviction um, um, to, to help a, a, a client. Adam and his team, um, Notre Dame Law School, um, especially a huge thanks to them, have written amazing legal analyses, reports, um, and that I've given you all of the links to here. And one where, I mean, I'm excited about all of them and very grateful for all of them. But the last one is so cool, an Indiana Tenants Habitability Guidebook. It's gonna still be released. Today or tomorrow. Today or tomorrow. And um, so uh, this guides a person through all of the issues of how to claim a habitable living condition. HRSA is so impressed by this that um, they're gonna be sharing this with other states of the union so that they see this model of um, how you can help people claim their right to a habitable home. So um, that leads in, in brief, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on these, but um, they would have to address the habitability problem in our state, my friends, please, please. Here's a quote from one of our participants. I'm not gonna read it, but I'm gonna tell you this. She had positive mold screen in her blood during pregnancy. And this is really scary to us in pediatrics because we know a positive mold screen is damaging to the woman and the fetus. This is pictures of her apartment when she moved in. You see the black mold in the kitchen, on the floor, in the walls. This is the one that the out-of-state landlord wanted her to pay $8,000 in damages for. But my awesome team advocated and got that released. We have had 13 of 25 women in our program come to us because they were living in uninhabitable conditions that led to their eviction or housing insecurity. Even with all of the hard work of our door and our case managers, we've still had habitability issues and we've had to move four of our participants out of the, our initial apartment. Um, I'm really proud of the team, 13 participants have used all of these people's advocacy to address landlord issues, to um, help improve the habitability of their conditions. So moving forward, this is our next big aim. Um, I have a pending HUD proposal um, where we will be implementing HUD's healthy home intervention for all the participants in Healthy Beginnings at Home, as well as the participants in Indianapolis Healthy Start. And I helped the city of Indianapolis with their HUD capacity building grant to address lead contamination. And it was just awarded this week, $1.2 million. So over the next three years, we'll be working to build the capacity of places in Indianapolis to reduce lead poisoning. This is our hope and vision for all moms and babies in Indiana. I strongly believe my friends that every pregnant mom Every baby and child has a right to access affordable, quality, safe housing. And this housing meets the HUD standard of a healthy home. I can tell you, if we do this, we will improve and optimize the birth comes, birth outcomes for families in our state. 
I'm not going to read these, but like I said, we're grounded in the stories of the women. So we asked the women, what? We asked the women, why do you want the Children's Commission to know? And here's a couple of responses for you. So the first one is, we said, how's this program impacted your life? It's a rather long quote. I'm not going to read it. But why I'm so proud of my team and what we ground all of our work on is what I see the woman say. And by the way, I don't interact with these women. I stay out purposely, right? Because I kind of have to evaluate this program. So, so, um, so I'm always hoping that I know all these awesome people do this, but you'll see there that, that this program has made me feel seen. And the people who work there, um, give me support and she has someone to go to and um they're not they don't judge we help we don't judge we walk with them right and we support them the next one is um what would you like the lawmakers to know about our program and i highlighted this one um at the bottom because it really kind of sums up for wisdom sums up Kind of what we're hoping for is that lawmakers should know that through this program, people get a second chance or even third chance, regardless of our credit score. This particular woman had a terrible credit score beyond her control, which prevented her from being able to get a place and gives us an opportunity. Here's the key. Give us opportunity and time to be able to better ourselves and our kids' lives. Stability is needed. You all probably learned this in Psych 101. The Maslow's hierarchy. You kind of have to have shelter. You have to have food. You have to have that sense of security before you progress. And that's what we're doing in Housing Equity for Infant Health. Thank you very much. Does the commission have questions for Dr. Terman? I, I did one real in the beginning of your program, and I may be talking to the wrong person. Do you use midwives and do? No, like I, I don't the all of the all of the individuals are cared for through uh, their yes. care source Medicaid. Okay. You know I mean, like so whoever they access representative summers. Does that make sense? I don't yes, know that. I understand. Does that make sense? Yes. Do you know what I mean? Like, yes, I understand. Sure. Yeah, yeah. All right. Great. Excellent presentation. Thank you, Thank so you much, Dr. Everyone. Cronin. Have a great day. All right, next up we have Mark with a presentation on the best youth initiative. Uh, and before we go into that, I want to uh, highly embarrass Kay Fidel, who's in the back of the room, here to support Chuck's presentation. Um, she sadly is moving on to new opportunities, and, and that means that we're losing her as a chair of one of our task forces, but she's put in a tremendous amount of time and effort and energy uh, into everything that we've done and really helped shape that into something that's as meaningful as it has been. So. I also recognize her for a couple of brief moments there for all of that wonderful work. Um, and now would be the time that uh, if we have a judge in the room that wants to, you know, overturn her resignation. That'd be great. <laughs> okay, well, we've got some constitutional lawyers at the back of the room there, so I don't know if we can get away with that, but that's fine. Um, so um, I'm going to talk just briefly, uh, and we actually have one of our folks um, that's also working in partnership with us on the Best Youth Initiative joining us remotely. Um, a brief update on what we've been doing with the Best Youth Initiative. Again, that is the project that Indiana was awarded in five states in the country, um, and we decided to emphasize uh, the issue of chronic absenteeism and school attendance. Um, so we have our partners from DOE, Department of Health, um, DMHA, um, and uh, we actually have about a dozen state agencies representing some form or another on that initiative looking at solutions of what we can do. Um, 
So what we had is uh, a launch in July where we went down to DC and we had um, our team um, as well as um, several youth uh, with lived experience with that issue and their parent member as well. Um, and then in the middle of last month, we had a set of uh, interviews with different state agencies, stakeholders, educators, and others from across the state where the team from the Forum for Youth Investment came and interviewed them and gathered information. Um, and I think almost everybody in this room was a part of that in one way or another, helping find other folks for us to talk to and bring that together. Um, and capture a lot of the information there. Um, so I'll hand it over to the folks from the forum, um, if they're online now, Lane, um, to be able to kind of go over a little bit of the forums they're coming from that. Hey, Uma, can you hear me? I can hear you. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's hard to follow that prior presentation on infant mortality. I want to congratulate you. That was incredible success. Um, so hopefully, this initiative will also show outcomes that are equally impressive. Uh, as Mark said, we um, thank you for having me. First, I should say that uh, I'm sitting here in Aspen, Colorado uh, at a um, poverty uh, convening. So it, these are all tied together, right? You, you see it, poverty, disparities, poor outcomes, um, and some of the the trends that we're going to talk about on truancy will also mirror some of that. So I, before I start, I want to tell you, Mark and Blaine have been just absolutely fantastic partners for us locally. Um, they have made everything happen when we were on the grounds. They created all the meetings and focus groups and interviews that, and are continuing to support us. So thank you. And you have a fantastic commission. With that said, let's just dive a little bit into what the initiative itself is and where we are, um, what trends we have identified so far in our discovery process. So the best youth initiative sort of is anchored in a co-designed outcome-driven reform effort with innovative leaders. And it is important that we recognize that you can't implement anything without a youth and family-centered approach to system change. And we want to elevate promising practices. And we have been super impressed with where Indiana is on your truancy efforts, um, both with the focus in the school system um, and you know all the school districts locally, but also all the partners who have joined forces. If you could go to the next slide, please. Um, so this is the timeline of the initiative. We start in summer of 2024. Um, there was a national launch and convening. The Indiana team was there in DC. Um, it was it was amazing to meet everybody. Both people with lived experience came, young people, um, parent advocates, as well as folks who were in the public child serving systems. Then September to October was our landscape analysis and scan. We collected a lot of data. We conducted. We were on site for three days. And I will tell you, Blaine and Mark made sure that every minute of our time there was fully utilized in in, uh, in meetings. And then we had, um, we're in the process of doing some initial review of our findings. And from December to January, um, we, will, we will craft our report, which will have an analysis of all of our findings. And then th those will be presented to you as the commission. If you could go to the next slide, please. Um, so the discovery process was itself in, uh, intended to gain deeper insights into Indiana's youth serving systems and do a qualitative and a quantitative assessment. So both looking at the data, but also conducting interviews and focus groups to try to tease out what is happening on the ground on this issue of truancy and chronic absenteeism. Engage in a more of a generative and collaborative process. We didn't want it to be, you know, a core group of 10 people who were leaders telling, sort of defining what that landscape was, but really engaging in a, in more of a discovery process that was investing in those voices that understand most deeply what's happening on the ground. And so we wanted to explore contextual considerations on how strategies are being executed and leveraged. You know, what does JD, how does JDAI play into it? What's the impact of prosecuting attorneys responding to 
truancy referrals, um, what happens with foster youth, all those kinds of things, what happens when children say they're afraid to go to school because of bomb threats, those kinds of things like tease them out, um, what's happening with mental health, identify the strengths, challenges and emerging trends, behavioral health, mental health was really a very significant issue coming out of COVID. Um, and then develop an, a holistic understanding of the current landscape while gaining insights into the dynamics of youth and family preferences and needs, as well as the potential areas for growth, innovation, and effective coordination. If we could go to the next slide. Our goals were to understand your drivers of chronic absenteeism, to review the policies and practices that are in place to support regular attendance, assess and understand policies and practices that are needed to decrease chronic absenteeism, improve regular attendance, assist in selecting those strategies that are culturally responsive, inclusive and equitable, and then identify the resources needed to support implementation. Because ultimately, when we finish our discovery process and we put our report together, identify those areas that are ripe for both innovation and improvement, there will be an implementation plan that the state will then implement over the course of this initiative, um, which is three years to start to show that the, that we're turning the tide, right? That the data is starting to show improvement. If we can go to the next slide. So well, you see this long list over here. These were all the people that we either interviewed or have had focus groups with either virtually or when we were on site for three days. Um, and I won't go through this list, it's super long, but I'll pause you for a minute so you all can take a look at it. It, it. I think Mark and Blaine were incredibly thoughtful in reaching out to partners and those partners took them up on it. So we had a very robust and representative community of folks that we had the opportunity to speak with. We also went on a site visit and saw a community center, um, where we saw, you know, the incredible efforts locally in partnership with school system and local partners, uh, parents, uh, advocates around this issue of truancy with after school time, tutoring, mentoring, all the kinds of things that work. If we could go to the next slide, please. Um, so these are the data sources we've looked at, the youth risk behavioral survey data reports. Uh, we looked at kids count, we looked at education policy statements, we looked at Board of Education data, the state superintendent presented to the Board of Education just last month uh, on this issue of truancy and chronic absenteeism. It, it is a, if you haven't seen it, it's posted on the website. It is a very, very useful um, data set that speaks to what's happening on the ground in schools. Um, we, we looked at your chronic absenteeism legislation that is just now being rolled out, passed in uh, when, when session ended in 2024 and is in effect, effective, I believe, July 1st of this year. Um, we looked at your commission status reports, your enabling legislation reports, strategic plans, the Youth Justice Oversight Committee. We had conversations with a lot of folks who are involved in the youth justice work. Um, and then the national chronic absenteeism, because we do want to do a little bit of a comparison as to what's happening in Indiana versus across the country. If you could go to the next slide. So um, we, you know, there there are three types of changes in any initiative that that are that are the focus of any future implementation planning. So this is not something we're doing right now, but. One is structural changes, which are defined by what are, what's the funding, what's the accountability me mechanism, how is good practice rewarded, you know, or how does that impact policies, are the data sharing practices, how's data utilized. Relational changes are defined by how collaborative is the system, um, how does everybody work together, and how are the voices of people with lived experience, the students and the parents, lifted up. And then transformational changes are sort of where you want to head to, sort of your future state where you're shifting minds and shifting culture. If you could go to the next slide. So here, um, we sort of divided up some of the trends we were seeing into four buckets. Policy changes, practice changes, infrastructure, and partnerships. 
So from a policy chain standpoint, there is a challenge with YRBS data uh, taking the taking the surveys um, and largely because participation is is a struggle. The health department folks we spoke with said, you know, they, they not all schools are motivated to participate, and some do, but then it tends to skew the data. Um, there are barriers in policies such as consent approaches that vary drastically between principles. You are, um, you know, you you have a lot of local autonomy, a lot of different school districts, and and different school right principals and schools. All there's a certain degree of variance in how policies around truancy are applied. Um, there was some feedback that your abstinence only policy is impacting sex education, and that that then results in certain decisions manifesting in themselves sort of down down the road and there are difference in priorities with changes in the you know influencing data dissemination you've had a new health commissioner who's put emphasis on maternal and child health and other things which are really important but then the way the prior commissioner had his particular focus on data that on particularly on you know youth data and why are this particularly impacted like the YRBS set of um, data collection and dissemination practice um, staff are working in isolation due to the lack of mandatory links between positions um, variations in data collection practices again you sort of see some of that difficulty accessing comprehensive a lot of focus on YRBS on this chart. Um, ca capacity challenges for school-based health centers with services varying drastically by location. So you do have school-based health centers, you have community schools initiatives in some places, you have JDAI initiatives, but they vary. They vary by jurisdiction, and so it then impacts the response to truancy and chronic absenteeism. Um, there is significant partnership and collaboration between the Department of Mental Health, the Department of Health, and FSSA to build youth advisory boards. And that collaboration is just fantastic in Indiana. We see this ability, this commission has been really influential. You all have been really influential in building this overarching umbrella, if you will, underneath of which, you know, there is a youth advisory focus, like youth need to be part, their voices need to be heard, and how you can leverage that larger pool for specific activities as opposed to each group tapping the same resource or same source for more youth and more youth and more youth right so this has been I, I really have to say this is this has been very impressive and then the public defender and juvenile, juvenile ju systems are a bit constrained by structural issues like geographic justice disparities you do see different ways in which those responses happen on the ground Let's go to the next slide. Relational changes from that standpoint, you know, leveraging the Mental Health Association's Youth Advisory Board, youth inv involvement in policy discussions. This is like something you're doing well and need to continue to do. There are challenges in influencing actionable policy around youth voices. They are being acknowledged, they're being included, but their perspectives they felt were not always included in policymaking. And so what is that transparent response and how do you convey to them why decisions are made a certain way um, and how did their voices influence those decisions? Um, from a practice perspective, building relationships with schools is really important around YRBS and fostering trust and communication between Department of Health and Educational Institutions, and then the Public Defender Partnerships with Probation Offices to improve juvenile justice outcomes. There's a lot of variance, and can you get to a more standardized approach? Um, there's a little bit of lack of continuity in school relationships due to staff turnover on the ground, um, and you know between principals and superintendents, um, attendance liaisons, they aren't always there, those positions were cut. Um, and so there is some inconsistency of collaboration on the ground and school re resource officers are there in some schools, but are not in other schools, again, creating some unequal support systems. But the SROs were generally seen as a real asset uh, around this issue because those officers build really strong relationships with youth and also create a sense of safety in schools. Partnership. 
collaboration efforts with stakeholders, including doctors, schools, nonprofits, to advocate for data utilization, and then the role of coalitions in creating systemic changes to address barriers in health and justice systems. If you go to the next slide, which is your transformational changes, here's where you see a lot of input. Shifting cultural mindsets to be more receptive to youth mental health data and feedback. Um, there is no question that coming out of COVID, the social media impact, all the things you hear about, the youth mental health is at an all-time crisis right now. Um, so there needs to be an increased focus on social emotional learning and mental health in schools. Um, you know, that, that sort of open up policy opportunities to support students. Um, addressing data sharing policies to facilitate data-driven decision-making. How does FERPA link up with HIPAA, link up with, um, you know, um, what's the other one? Uh, mental health, the SAMHSA, the 42 CFR substance use. Those kinds of data sets, like figuring out how do you bump data and really get a full picture need some, some careful thinking, applying the right balance of restorative justice and accountability policies to address chronic absenteeism. What is the impact of sanctioning parents or imprisoning parents around, you know, absenteeism versus, you know, or out of school suspension strategies, like all of that has, has plays into this. From a practice standpoint, implementing a feedback loop involving across school staff partner agencies, people with lived experience, advocacy community to improve cross system collaboration. And when we went to the site, um, it, it was just a very impressive um, experience to see all that collaboration manifest itself in local community. Increased receptivity to cultural changes and acknowledgement of different roles. Uh, engaging people with lived experience in formal navigator roles, especially this was really important. If you had a parent navigator um, that was available, you know, through through the school system who was reaching out and part of that whole attendance liaison function or school counselors, how did they all team up? If there were parent navigators who walked in those shoes, advising parents, reaching out to them, supporting them, uh, we heard a lot about kids not having alarm clocks and not being able to wake up in the morning, so providing them with alarm clocks, those kind of strategies um, were really, but the navigator function was really li lifted up as an important strategy, creating whole family strategies to address root causes, right, if families are homeless, if uh, there is domestic violence, you know, the reasons for elementary school absenteeism is very different from adolescent high school student absenteeism. And sometimes those reasons were interesting. Youth said to us if their parents were in divorced families and they were visiting two sets of parents, you know, the school bus only comes to one address. The other parent may or may not sometimes be able to get the kid to school. After school time activities being important, feeling a sense of belonging, they said was really important in the school community. Um, so addressing some of those issues, hunger was a really important strategy. If children are hungry, they're less engaged in school. How can you focus on studies when you're hungry, right? Simple things like that. Simple, but very not always easy to solve. Um, hiring more attendance liaisons and school counselors, your ratios are very high, and that is an issue that has some relevance. The JDAI uh, and community schools districts that we spoke with really showed good results with attendance, but not every school district is either participating in JDAI or has uh, school counselors. The issue of educa educational neglect and DCS responses came up also. Um, in, from an infrastructure standpoint, reintroducing mentorship, shadowing metrics to bridge generational divides and support professional development for teachers. Um, shifting mindsets to see school-based health centers with mental health component and capacities um, in the school community and improving service provision. You know, there is a shortage of mental health providers. So schools are sometimes the safest place for students to access these services. How do we build those up? And then building alliances between CISC and JDAI and other statewide collaboratives. You are the same people sitting in multiple meetings. So the, to, to the degree that you're able to align those conversations and those um, 
those forums where you are talking about these issues with the same set of people, that there is value in that. And then longer term collaboration between youth advisory boards, policymakers, and health departments with sustainable change. Uh, if we could go to the next slide. Time for questions. So I'll pause. Um, you can see that we dug fairly deep. This is a very high level synthesis. Our report will capture a lot more. Um, some of the findings that and the information that was shared with us. Uh, we did promise everybody we would not uh, assign, you know, we wouldn't speak to names or assign roles just so that there would be some safety for people to share their perspectives. And what you see here is a fairly um, careful capture of those findings. Any questions for Uma? I don't know if this is protocol, but I'm here from the Indiana Housing and Community Development Authority. We do have an, a functioning youth advisory board, so I'm really excited that you mentioned that. Um, and we cover the whole state of Indiana. I just want to encourage the collaboration between health and housing because health is a social determinant. I mean, housing is a social determinant of health. So I hope that we can continue to be engaged with you as another state agency who's very concerned for the health of our youth and young adults. Thank you. No, I could not have said it better. The one thing we didn't capture here, you did talk about, you know, when they are homeless and they're, you know, either they're couch serving, sub surfing sometimes, or they're staying with parents in unsafe housing conditions, how difficult it is to focus on their learning. And also by the same token, not every, the other, the other spectrum, not every child is going to go to college and building more vocational training capabilities to engage students who are not on a college path, but to legitimize and give credence to those other vocational pathways to keep students engaged was also a really important um, tool in the toolkit. Other questions for Emma? Thank you, Emma. All right, great. Thanks, everybody. We'll be in touch again. Now we get to hear from Mark again for his executive director update. All right, and thank you again for our presenter so far today. I know it. I uh, didn't get mentioned directly, but uh, the forum has uh, definitely been very clear that Indiana is in first place of the five states that are going for this initiative, too. So I just wanted to make sure that that was on the record there. Um, I did some very unbiased analysis on that. <laughs> oh, um, sorry. I didn't say that, Mark. Of course, we are completely biased in favor of Indiana. They rock. <laughs> so... Yay. So that's the important elements there, right? We're a competitive state. All right. Well, I'm going to uh, follow up on some of that. Um, wait, uh, wait. I have to say whether they are competitive or not, Mark Fairchild is very competitive. <laughs> I just How much did we pay you? <laughs> <laughs> the fact that we can always win has nothing to do with how competitive I am. <laughs> All right. Um, so moving on to our agenda a little bit, um, I think we'll find that a lot of what we're talking about flows together here. Um, again, do you want to recognize everybody that's been a part of Best Youth so far? That's been uh, great to see. Um, and a lot of comments about the, the model programming that we have across our state as we've been involved with Best Youth. I've already had several states reach out to want to talk to Indiana about what we're doing, how our commission works, um, other practices and programs that we have in place. So. Um, it is always good to be part of these initiatives to get a good landscape of what's going on, but also to inform your own efforts back. So, um, but really a lot of positive feedback on what we're doing here. Certainly that we can keep growing and doing better on, um, but that we're off to such a wonderful start on so many things. We'll see if the remote's working for me. All right. There we go. 
Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit on where we're at with family and youth engagement, um, some of the different initiatives we've had in the past, what we see kind of coming up. And then, yes, I do have a pitch for you that I think I promised at our last meeting, um, but really flowing into the discussions we've had today about how we're working with the Best Youth Initiative, um, Dr. Sherman's talk on having um, the voices of women really informing that practice and how that's led to better outcomes um, really weds very closely to what we've been doing here for, for several years. So um, as most of you know that we've had four youth representatives directly on the commission, our second cohort. It's not leaving us just yet, but pretty soon we'll be shopping for a third cohort there. So I uh, will be missing Ailey and Julia for all the great work that they've done. Um, so um, hopefully we find a way to keep them captured in there, but informing all of our efforts and being a part of the decision-making body. Um, we have a youth member on one of our task forces as well. Um, we've had three family and youth uh, engagement summits. Um, we actually have our fourth activity coming up just next week. So I'll have a little QR for you to scan for all the details and stuff on that towards the end. It's in uh, the members packets here as well, looking at strategic sharing and helping uh, young adults that have been through issues that have been a part of our state systems, share their voices, uh, share their stories, but do it in a way that helps all of you be able to take that and make change with it. Um, so we're very excited to be having more of that coming forward. Um, we, of course, had our inaugural Youth Day at the State House uh, last year, um, actually earlier this year. Um, hundreds of youth showing up on their day off of school, which always makes us very proud to see that they're choosing to use that time to be a part of their government and part of processes and learning how to get involved. So we co-sponsored that with the Marion County Commission on Youth and some other partners there. Um, of course, being selected for the Best Youth Initiative. Um, and we now have our first task force that we created specifically with the emphasis on family and youth representation as the priority for that one, um, looking at suicide, bullying, prevention, and online safety. So a lot of work that we've done in this space that really started with dabbling with saying, well, let's put a couple of youth on the commission and see where it goes um, just a few years ago and seeing that growth go just tremendously forward. Um, a few things that we have coming up that we're looking at is adding some educational opportunities. So when we have the youth and family members that are part of the commission, what are we doing to make sure they have the information they need and they're getting proper educational support? So when something's offered to the staff of the commission, we make sure that our youth that are on the commission that have an interest in learning and building their expertise and becoming potential professionals in the space, are we supporting them appropriately too? So that's something we're looking further into. So going to some of the wonderful events that we have locally here, IYI's annual conference, you know, where they put on a wonderful, wonderful event, um, other things like that. How can we make sure we're enriching their experience and giving back? Um, still have the goal of getting youth membership on every single one of our task forces as well. So we just put out a big ask for our new task force, and we'll be fielding that out to see if there's extra candidates that maybe would be a good fit for some of the other work that we do as well. Um, we're looking at in this coming uh, legislative session expanding the youth day at the state house. So day one will be youth day at the state house, where we get them front and center, learning how to advocate, talking to the legislators, and day two digging in a little bit more about what a potential journey into getting more directly involved in policy and advocacy, using their voices, elevating their story. What can that look like? So the youth that really want to go that next level and say maybe there's a little bit more I want to do here. What are we doing to nurture that? I'm bringing their voices front and center so we as a state can benefit from. Um, and then a big item that um, we've been uh, looking at over the last year, um, as we've been exploring across the state, all the different uh, youth and family engagement programs that are out there within state agencies, um, in other pockets across the state, uh, local municipalities, at schools, um, we're finding so many wonderful programs, initiatives, groups coming together, uh, representing and elevating those voices. Um, we, every time we go out and talk, we find five more places recommended to us that we need to be in touch with and talking to. Um, and we're learning an incredible amount on a near daily basis every time we do that, whether it's having the folks come with us to DC for Best Youth Initiative, um, our youth commission members here, um, whether we go out to a listening session in the community, Chronic absenteeism has been a great learning curve for us too, because boy, the, the students have no problem telling us why school is difficult for them and what's keeping them 
from coming there, whether it be safety, whether it be, is it meaningful? Whether it be as school, what it envisions my future being, match what I envision my future being. Um, so many wonderful things we're learning about how our state policy can be driven better when we incorporate those voices in there. So a concept that we've started um, putting out there is development of a family and youth engagement network where we try to encapsulate, nurture, expand all those efforts going on across our state and within state agencies especially, um, and form some kind of convening for them, whether that's some virtual ones as well as some in person, but how can we make this an even stronger initiative? And how can we take all these separate efforts that are doing wonderful work across all sorts of issues and find a way to elevate and encourage their voices coming forward and, and bringing it to the forefront of our policymakers' minds at all times. So big project moving forward. I can say every time we brought it up to anybody, one, most people bring it up first and saying, we need to find a way to get all this together. Um, and two, nobody has raised their hand to say they want to be the one to do it. Because um, it's, it's definitely a big heavy lift, but most have also said, this is this is the Children's Commission. This is convening all these different elements together and finding a way to share them and get them up front of the right people. This is what you do. Um, you're not going to take anything over. You're going to find a way to take all of that and share it outward and make sure we all get our voices heard. Um, so a big project moving forward that we're looking forward to diving into. Um, our last two interns working on family and youth engagement pieces have been uh, doing a lot in this space to try to organize that and get that focused forward. So what does that mean? Well, that means Mark has to ask for some things. Um, as we've been diving into this, we've definitely found this is a massive issue with massive benefits for our state. Um, I cannot say enough how every single state agency I talk to has something going on in this space where they're trying to get voices to the table, they're forming a new youth advisory board, they're trying to find more ways to bring that forward up from the policymakers, they're learning the benefits, just like, again, we heard from Dr. Truman's um, discussion earlier, saying, boy, when we listen and we incorporate that, our outcomes go up, we have improvements, we're saving Medicaid dollars, we're having a better result. We're keeping more kids in school. We're now moving on to become taxpayers who are contributing and adding back into what we do as a state. So what do we need to make that happen? For all those future activities that we're looking at there, I can say right now, and I'll share some time studies we did on this in a second. Right now, we're really at just the very edge of how much we can do with what we currently have at the commission level. Um, so needs that we see moving forward is saying doing more events, whether it be online, getting some of these national speakers and others together, um, funding to be able to do that, especially if we look at in-person convenings. We're very lean at how we do that. Um, we don't have any grand and glorious catering services coming in. We have a free conference center here at the state, but there are some costs associated with doing that as well. Um, looking at funding the family and youth initiatives directly, such as making sure they have proper educational support, um, getting them out to different events and letting them be a part of that, um, whether that be representing us or for their own education, paying travel and mileage reimbursement with people all over the state that we want to have represented. If we have an in-person thing, how do we get them here? If we can do it virtually, how can we support that the best way possible for their time? Um, and of course, for our young adults who are involved, we do make sure that we reimburse them for their time. Um, they're coming in with expertise, uh, and they have other priorities in their life, too. We need to respect that expertise, especially if they're coming and giving their voice from a participant in the state system. They're the type of experts that none of us can be, and we need them at the table and treated as experts. So we need to see them appropriately. Um, and then most importantly, as we look through what we have for our current resources and the amount of support we need to do to do this correctly, we do need to look at adding a position for outreach and engagement of the youth and families with lived experience um, and youth and family engagement really statewide at all levels. So I did a quick time study of just the last uh, year or so of, of time that um, myself and our coordinator have spent in some of these spaces. 
Um, I won't make everybody squint through every line of that, um, but you can see we pulled out a lot of primary categories. Most of those are kind of where we'd expect to, to be, right? In my position, a lot of time spent on supervision and admin kind of tasks, supporting some of our different meetings there. But you can definitely see that there's some growth there in, in the family and youth engagement pieces, um, the communication related to that. Um, and I'd also note that this is a sampling for a year leading up to when the Best Youth Initiative launched um, in uh, July of this year. So that's not incorporating that. So um, looking at those numbers added to that, you'd add a good 10% of, of my time going into that and how that uh, impacts our family and youth engagement elements. Um, and now Blaine, who of course um, we brought on board a while ago and has been doing a lot of the work in this space um, you see an even larger change there as far as the amount of time he's allocating into family and youth engagement activities. So going up to about a third of his time total on that versus about a quarter of my time in that space. And that's not counting that we have uh, intern working exclusively in this space. Um, we have Peyton, who's doing a lot of admin support that goes unseen on making sure that you know they get their stipends and get paid and that we're taking care of them properly. Um, we're communicating properly with everybody and doing all those things right. Um, so really, when we break it down and we add Best Youth Initiative, I can say we're already, with our current activities, not even looking at that future list that I showed, we're at about 80 to 85% of a full-time equivalent uh, staff position um, at this level. So, um, And it is taking away from other areas. It, it always does. We've got to make those shifts to decide where are we going to put our attention. We've got a lot of other task forces. We've got well over 150 volunteers in different capacities uh, with the commission. We've got a lot of communication we have to do. Um, we're getting more active in the state house to make sure legislators are aware of our work and our efforts there. But it's hard to ramp those up when we want to make sure that we're taking care of these individuals whose uh, lives and their lived experience are impacting our work every day too. So we've got choices we have to make at this point and they're hard choices to make about how to prioritize that. So um, looking forward, um, I, I did do a brief financial breakdown of what some of this will look like when we translate to dollars in the world. Um, Looking at those additional events and activities, I've already reached out to some partners. They're very, very interested in working with us long term. Uh, Casey Family Programs, who supported us, um, looking at the villages of Indiana. We've had a great uh, talk on how we coordinate there. Marion County Commission on Youth is, is all in favor of saying how much more can we do, how much more can we get involved. And we know there's going to be more facts moving forward. Indiana Youth Institute, an incredible partner with us as well. Um, so we're pretty confident that we can minimize the cost of doing additional convenings, in-person events and virtual events um, down to somewhere around the $500 or $5,000 threshold. Um, and some of that would be taken out of really tweaking our existing budget and seeing where else can we be more financially responsible and cut some corners and reduce our costs there. Um, so the, all these numbers are not direct asks. Um, if so, those of you that have already done the math, the number at the bottom is not the same as the total of the other numbers. Um, do you look at um, adding more reimbursement for the, uh, especially the youth representatives and the youth representation on the task forces as well? So that's that stipends that's paid again at the same level as a lay member of an interim study committee, um, which we feel is a, is a good compromise for an individual um, outside of state government that's bringing expertise in. Um, that's that's really the definition of what they're doing. They're acting as a lay member to our work. Um, and then a little bit for educational opportunities that we would want to encourage to get them at and present there. Um, noted that the Best Youth Initiative is not included in this because um, the Foreign Free Youth Investment is the funding partner on that that has been stepping up every time we want to do something. Um, and, and there needs to be funding attached. Even though focus groups that we're going to be doing later this month, they're going to make sure people get reimbursed for their time there too. Um, so again, we try to make sure that we have responsible partners wherever we can before we look at what more can we add. Um, of course, the big, big item on the list there is looking at salary benefits and support costs for a new staff person. Um, so you can see that we put some estimates in there uh, based roughly on what we already have experienced on Plains position since we're looking at similar coordinator level position being added there. Um, so total ask. Um, that I'd like permission to pursue um, as far as drafting some draft legislation and legislative language on uh, would be looking at about $90,000 
uh, annually additional. Um, yeah, and I see we were pointing over there. On that. Yeah. So um, right now our funding is 350 annually, so looking at going up to 90, um, which as you can see, it, it's most entirely looking at additional staffing costs to do this and do this well. Um, and the alternative is we really need to look at where do we need to hit the brakes to make sure we're not compromising our current activities for diving so much into something that we really can see a value for for the state. Um, but going so far that we compromise some of our other core activities doing that, right? Um, so that's really what we're looking at there. Um, and, you know, again, I think I've, I've gone through most of this, but, you know, why should we do this and why should we expand these efforts? Um, this falls right into our commitment for improving the status of children um, by incorporating the family and youth voices. We've we've seen it already in a lot of what we've done. A lot of the, the policies that we brought in have been informed by that and been more meaningful as a result. Uh, we see state programs that have brought in those voices and use that to inform their work, making meaningful changes where positive optimization of state programs has gone up um, and utilization of what we want them to use, preventative activities have gone up. All of those translate into cost savings for the state down the line, as well as just healthier, crucial well-being across the board. Um, and again, I can't emphasize enough the movement towards incorporating more lived experience voices and more family and youth voices across the state, but also just across all of the different uh, organizations that we've worked with and nationally just continues to grow. Um, it's a huge area. People are seeing the benefit here. This is an opportunity for Indiana to continue to be a leader. Um, so I, I mentioned earlier that I probably got calls to uh, go out and talk to a couple of other states about what we're doing and why it's a good practice for their state. So they're already seeing the value. They're seeing that we're creating a model here. And we want to maintain that we're a leader in that space, that um, as much as we'll be an outlier on best youth, we might be the only reddish state um, on the list there that's saying that's not a barrier for us. That's strengths that we lean into of where can we come in despite our differences, despite the different makeup across the country, that we're a state that finds the right way to do things uh, for our families, for our youth, and we do that by using them as information for what we should be a part of. Um, so the impact only goes up. Um, and of course, it is in our enabling legislation that we're supposed to be working with stakeholders and we're supposed to be working with those who have experienced voices and be present in those discussions. Um, we might look at if we want to make a legislative tweak um, to say, do we want to make that um, in our enabling legislation? Do we want to emphasize even more, you know, that we're taking more of a leadership role in this space? But um, that, that's already noted in what we're supposed to be doing and how we're doing it, which is why we moved in this space to begin with. Um, so that's what I have. So what I'm seeking is um, action today to approve the drafting of uh, language to go into legislation, uh, budget-wise and potentially into our uh, enabling legislation to just put a, a higher level of, of importance on integrating family and youth voices in our efforts. Questions or discussions for Mark regarding his ask? I'll say that we we cover the administrative kind of overhead costs for the Children's Commission and, and staff, and it works really, really well. And Mark and I have talked about this proposal before. It's within the Supreme Court's the budget structure, but not something that we can go ask for. We're fully supportive of of this, and I think it'd be a, a he would make excellent use of the staffing and the resources if it puts into it. So I'd, I I would move to approve this. So you're saying you don't have any surplus funding in your Supreme Court accounts? No, and I, you know, I shake Mark down every time he comes in the elevator lobby for whatever loose change he might have. So <laughs> that's true. He does. It's it's becoming awkward. <laughs> I make a motion that we do approve the legislation moving forward. All right. A second. We have a motion in a couple of seconds. I think. Any further discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 Right. Opposed me. Excellent. Right. Uh, and in the spirit of our December meeting, where we go into more formal discussion on legislative language and all that, of course, we'll have that prepared for everybody to, to take a look at at that point in time. If I can just make a quick comment, too, and I know um, and on revenues, right? So it's been kind of known already that revenues this year is going to be really tough. And so um, expectations are high, but at the same time, we have to be realistic on our uh, abilities and um, to, re to 
see what their ways and means and appropriation chairs, right, to see if they have it available or not. But it could be a tough year to make that ask. So with that, knowing that. Um, yeah. Checking Mark's couches. Um, okay. I have not checked those yet. Thank you for pointing that out. All right. Well, I appreciate the support on that. So uh, just a couple of other things on uh, my list. We might actually end a couple of minutes early, depending on how much I talk. So I know that I say that every time and it just doesn't seem to work out, does it? So then you need me to do things? Yes. Yes, yeah, sir. We have one of those nice old fashioned hook off the side. I think that'd be a great I visual for the to... people online. Uh, so just a couple of other things I want to note. Again, this is the meeting where we um, at least start the discussion on legislative engagement and what we might look at getting uh, involved in in the next year, formalizing that at our December meeting. Um, so I do want to just kind of recapture the items that we talked about last year, uh, make sure that those are still ones that we feel like make sense to have on the list, and then any initial discussion on new items we haven't captured before. Um, a reminder that anything that's within our strategic plan and has been translated into our task forces is already included. Um, so there's a lot of issues that you want to make sure that, that we are actively attached to or that we can act on if they come up. Um, but that's why we created the process we did last year saying, look, if it's in there, we understand that that's an issue the commission can speak on. Um, and still, if it gets to something where it's like working directly on a bill that that comes back to the commission, comes back to the executive committee to make sure that we understand that we're doing a little bit more direct action there. Um, but the, the issues that we proved last year, uh, early childhood mental health, which I'd note that we did create a subcommittee on that uh, shortly thereafter. So that is something that's now part of our formal process. So something that we would be continuing to work on. Um, suicide prevention and bullying prevention. Um, again, our new task force has been created on that. Um, certainly, even if there's not a piece of legislation they can recommend just yet, because they're still in that formative stage, um, as things come forward at the State House, if there's something that makes sense that fits within our priorities, um, that just gets permission to say, yes, we can say, one, the commission is working in the space, and two, that we, we respect any process that promotes a reduction of suicide and bullying risks um, for our youth. Um, Improving YRBS participation rates, which has been an ongoing one um, related to our data work in our child health and safety group. Um, uh, again, Kate was presenting that for us uh, year after year. We'll have to see who the new Kate's going to be on that. Um, but continuing to say we need to be data informed if we're doing good work. Um, supporting the Youth Justice Oversight Committee, which is now entering, I don't know if we're at 2.0 or 3.0 of the Youth Justice Oversight Committee. Um, but again, that branch out that originated through the Children's Commission that's uh, uh, looking at the specific youth justice elements uh, across our state. We keep finding more and more intersects there as we go along. So continuing any work that helps them as there may be some legislative tweaks or anything that happened. Um, over the next session, which we're anticipating some possible ones to make sure we open up funding better and, and can support their work a little bit better there. Um, and then lastly, we had increasing uh, access to quality child care. Um, I know we've, we'd love to think we've resolved that child care crisis, but uh, right, still a long ways to go on, on that and working on that infrastructure as well. So those are the items we had um, from last year that we did discussed, including um, does anybody have any comments about those or one that they want to remove or they just don't care about child care anymore? <laughs> um, anybody want to introduce any issues that were not on that list that um, they want to check if we're able to act on or that we want to add to this list at this point? And for our earlier presentations on housing security, that is within our strategic plan. So that one's there. So definitely not, not forgetting to do that. And we're really trying to find more ways to encapsulate that discussion in as we go forward to, because that is such a linchpin to a lot of bullying. So, um, and this is the end of the discussion. After this meeting, feel free, if there's more items you want to consider that you want to get added on to that list, um, they're going to move forward on. Um, and I can say one other item as far as legislation, um, the CHIN's 3.5 human trafficking legislation that's been pulled for the last few years will be coming through again. Um, that's been endorsed and supported directly by the commission um, in multiple past times. So we expect that to come forward. Um, so that, that's one that we would expect to be testifying and supportive as well as we have over the last two or three years there. 
Um, but other than that, and looking at pending the financial ask um, that we're putting together here, those are the key items that we have as far as items created through the commission process um, that would be going forward. Right. Let's see, do I have anything else for y'all today? Um, I think that's really most of what we have. So main item is remember the December 11th meeting, which will be our last one of the year. Um, that is where we also have a brief reception afterwards. Um, invite other people to come, please do. Anybody that you think needs to know about the commission might want to get involved more of our task force or committees or anything there, because that's also the meeting where we have our task forces and committees come and do a report about their activities for the year, uh, what they've accomplished, recommendations they go for, recommendations they're working on. So if you have anybody that's, that's curious about potential rules to be there, we encourage them to come and attend. And yes, they can stay for that reception afterwards. Um, it's a good time for us to recruit some folks um, that might want to get a little bit more directly involved in everything that we do. Um, and then lastly, I'll have on the screen there, and uh, um, those in person in the room have a hand as well, our strategic sharing series uh, that was mentioned earlier uh, is kicking off next Thursday, and then it'll be every two weeks on Thursday after that for a series of three sessions talking about strategic sharing, using your voice. This is... Um, Yes, it'll have tools for teaching our youth and family members about how to share their stories and use their voice, but it will also be open to professionals that just want to get a better idea of what it means to do that, what it means to encourage somebody to use their voice and share their story and wants to be a part of that discussion. So we don't have any cap on registration. That is completely free. That's a service that we're providing outward um, to a lot of the different groups that we're working with. But again, feel free to share that as widely as you would like. Um, regardless if it's a community member, um, a, a, a child in school that just is looking for what their next step could be for getting involved in things or somebody who's been directly impacted by our state systems, we'd be very, very happy to have as many people participate in that as possible. So, and that's it for me. Questions for Mark? Yes. Just Maybe a couple of comments, and I know we had our um, summer study this past summer dealing with fatal review reports and stuff, and we've not made a recommendation yet. I've been waiting for Kate Collins with DCS. She's going to meet with one of the presenters that, um, and it looks like we may move some legislation based on that. So I've not come back with a, you know, a full report or recommendation from the summer study to move forward. You do not have a summer study. Well, again, I think we're going to have a recommendation, and I, I'll talk to all the committee members. I'll give you a call or just talk to you to say, do we need to really come back together to move legislation forward? So, um, but anyway, with that, I'd like to also recommend has anybody seen the movie The Sound of Hope? Nobody? It's put it on your like to do watch, must watch list. It's, it's a um, bishop. We got jealous. We watched it on. Is it Prime? Oh man! I know. So the sound of hope. It's a community in Possum Trot, Texas. Possum Trot, Texas is right next to Boonville, so you know it's really close to the edge of the earth, right? Um, but it's out in the boondocks. But uh, it's a true story of a com small community that adopted 77 kids in their whole county to where there was no more kids to be adopted. And if every kid came from a loving household, and, um, we wouldn't have a lot of the problems that we do today in this world. So I'd really love you to, uh, and we're working with um, some folks in Indiana to try to reach out to all of our pastors in the state. If every church would adopt at least one child, we wouldn't have any more foster kids. So it's just a neat, and this gentleman I got to meet, the pastor, uh, the bishop, um, was really, really good. So I can't encourage you enough to watch it, The Sound of Hope. Thank you for that. Do you have any other announcements or discussion from the group? All right, if not, we are adjourned a little bit early. Have a great day, everyone.